one more baptism as we
Good morning, everybody. It's so good to see you all. Welcome to anybody who's online who's signing in to worship with us today. We're glad to have you. I just have a few announcements to make, and it's of most importance. There is now red licorice in the back. So make sure you get a little bit of that. Everybody ought to be happy. If not, I don't know what I can do for you there. Also, just to um, let you know, we're not going to be having a children's um, message before communion today. So when the communion slide comes up, that's when the, the kids can be released to go to their class downstairs. Just so you're aware of that, that that has changed today because Dick is not here and he's preaching. <laughs> so we will just have things flow. Also, before we start and as the team's starting to make their way forward, I just would ask, would you please stand and can we open with a word of prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day, for this opportunity to gather together, all as one, to worship and praise you with every fiber of our being, Lord. We pray that our worship and praise will be a pleasing aroma to you. We just ask that you will be with each and every person who's involved with guiding us and leading us in this worship time. Father, we love you and we praise you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray and ask these things. Amen. Psalm 136.1, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Ephesians 3, 16 to 17, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power to a spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith.
Revelation 4.11. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Two. Shout, Shout for joy, joy to the Lord, to the Lord all the earth. earth. Worship, Worship the Lord with gladness. gladness. Come and before Lord him with joyful Lord. songs. Isaiah 53 5. And children, you may be dismissed. Okay, Isaiah 53 5. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. Would you please stand with us for communion?
our um, founding fathers with the Declaration of Independence started this country. And with some providential help, they um, put together the Constitution and the Bill of Rights was laid within it and it gave us protection of uh, religious freedom, securing the right to gather as believers and worship. And with that in mind, the past two years have had governments around the world telling churches what they could and couldn't do. And it left a lot of people just standing like a deer in the headlights. And through this, some particular verses have jumped out at me. Ephesians 6, 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Isaiah 59, 14. And judgment is turned away backward and justice standeth afar off, for truth is fallen in the street and equity cannot enter. Isaiah 5.20, woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Then Proverbs 11.1, 1, a false balance is an abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. Through, through scripture, God is teaching us that relying on man and not him is a big problem. We can only truly rely on the Lord Jesus Christ. I, I would say that 90% of all elected officials appear to have no fear of God, and that leaves them being guided, as Ephesians six twelve states, they're being guided by the rulers of darkness and spiritual wickedness. Now, our historical founding documents could be considered the most outstanding documents ever penned, giving protections for the individual liberties. And again, protecting our religious freedom and the right to gather as believers in worship. Although these historical documents are not inspired scripture, God knew every word, period, and comma that would be within them before the framers were even born. A pastor once made this statement, has it ever occurred to you that that nothing occurs to God. God's vision, 2020 vision is perfect looking forward. God has total grasp of everything. And God has prepared a more superior declaration of independence. It is the declaration of freedom from sin through the Lord Jesus Christ and his shed blood. With Paul's letter to the Romans, we can formulate a pretty concise view of God's plan. Romans, Paul's opening of Romans, chapter 1 through 4. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he had promised before by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the son of God with power according to the scripture of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. And then Romans 6.6, 6, knowing this that our old man is crucified with him that the body of sin might be destroyed and henceforth we should not serve sin. Romans 6.22, but now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit 
unto holiness and the end, everlasting life. For the right wages of sin is death. On to verse 23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. With Jesus' earthly ministry, there is certain high points that's just good to always keep in mind. His virgin birth, his virgin birth, John 1, 14, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Christ's substitutionary death for sinners, taking our punishment onto himself, Christ's bodily resurrection from the dead on the third day, and Jesus' visible ascension back to the Father's right hand. There's a hymn called, that's titled, On Christ the Solid Rock I Stand, and its opening line sums it up really well. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus, Jesus Christ's blood and righteousness. And, and our communion reminds us that where our trust belongs in the Lord Jesus Christ and him only. Our Father, we just thank you for this time that we can gather and remember what your son did here on earth and that that he has taken our sin on the cross and we, we have nothing to look forward to but life everlasting with him. And we just thank you for what he's done for us in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat>
I'd like to start today with um, a story. Tony Llewellyn in his book shares the story uh, from James DeMillo about how he was at a friend's place who had a pit bull terrier. The, the man had a tire hanging from a tree, and so he got the dog all worked up, then shoved the tire at it. The dog latched on with its teeth. The man would shake the tire and swing it high into the air from side to side, but the dog would not let go. How long will he do that for, asked James. Oh, a couple of hours. Sometimes I go in and I eat a meal and he's still out there latched onto that tire. Really? He can go for that long? Yeah. Come on, let's go eat. They went inside, but the dog was still holding on to the tire. A couple of hours later, finally the owner had to go and pry the dog's jaws off the tire. You see, this is an example of what you might call pit bull faith. It never lets go of the promises and the teachings of God. Now, I bring this story up because it perfectly represents the type of faith Jesus has called us all to. We are to be a people who fully are entrenched with every fiber of our being into the truth, the promises, and the teachings of our Lord Jesus Christ. Today, as we we finish up John chapter 6, that is exactly what we are going to see that Jesus is trying to get his audience, as well as all of us here today, to understand. In fact, the very heart of what we will learn from the Lord today is that only true faith that clings to Jesus brings everlasting life. So you please turn with me, if you haven't already, John chapter 6. We're going to be starting in verse 41, in which I would like to do things just a smidgen bit differently today. First, I'd like to read the entire text as a whole. And then I'm going to explain a few things regarding it. And then I would like to narrow in on a few key verses within our overarching story that I feel perfectly summarizes what Jesus is trying to help us to understand. So let's start our reading, and we're going to be actually picking right up from where we left off last week. So verse 41 in John chapter 6, we see that the word of the Lord says, Therefore the Jews were grumbling about him, because he said, I am the bread that comes down out of heaven. For they were saying, Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he... Now say, I have come down out of heaven. Jesus answered and said to them, Do not grumble amongst yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up in the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught of God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Now that Not that anyone has seen the Father except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread which comes down out from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down out of heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread also which I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Then the Jews began to argue with one another, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man, drink his blood, you have no life in yourselves. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who eats me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread which came down out of heaven. Not as the fathers ate and died. He who eats this bread will live forever. 
These things he said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Therefore, many of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, This is a difficult statement. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, conscious that his disciples grumbled at this, said to them, Does this cause you to stumble? What then if you see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and are life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. And he was saying, For this reason I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted him from the Father. As a result of this, many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. So Jesus said to the twelve, You do not want to go away also, do you? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have words of eternal life. We have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Jesus answered them, Did I myself not choose you, the twelve, and yet one of you is a devil? Now he meant Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. So there's a whole lot going on there, and and you might have noticed when I said this might be a little bit of a difficult thing to understand, it's because there's a lot taking place here. So we have here 31 verses in which Jesus, just as we saw last week, is engaging in a lengthy conversation, not only with the 12 apostles, but also with his larger group of followers. Now this is not necessarily the 70, though they were probably a part of this. At this point, his group was even larger than the 70. However, we also have a third group that John labels as just simply the Jews. Now this title, the Jews, is pointing to some of the leading religious leaders and locals of the synagogue in Capernaum, because that's where he's teaching these things at right now. And very likely you may have had some of the Jews, the leaders from Jerusalem that could have been in this group of the Jews. But we're focusing more on the religious leaders and locals of the synagogue in Capernaum when it's talking about that. Here we learn that Jesus is continuing his teachings regarding himself as the living bread that comes out of heaven. It is at this point in his sermon that we get to the real issue regarding the hearts of the audience. You see, they are struggling to go all in and believe the truth Jesus is teaching. Now, this is because the people have taken what Jesus said about eating his body and drinking his blood literally. Basically, they think that Jesus is asking them to participate in cannibalism, which is a complete taboo and is directly rejected within the Old Testament law. So it wouldn't be hard for us to understand why they might be having an issue, but it's because they're not really listening to what Jesus is trying to get to them to understand. And you may be thinking, well, of course, this is talking about communion. Well, John does that on purpose. He wants that to be a part of what is being brought up here, that we would focus on the concept of communion, however, That's for us who are the audience that are on this side of the cross. Jesus is talking to his audience here. He's actually not referring to communion within this text, even though all the imagery brings that up in our mind. See, really what Jesus is, you you gotta understand communion, the concept of communion was given to us by God so that we can look back and remember what was done at the cross. Instead, what Jesus is doing here is urging his audience to look forward to what's about to take place on the cross and how important it is that they need what he is going to be offering. However, Jesus was also trying to get the people to to take a deeper look at things and focus on the spiritual implications. They, as well as all people of the world, need to be spiritually filled by Jesus and his spirit. And they need to be spiritually cleansed by Jesus' sacrifice in order to be free from sin, death, and to receive everlasting life. 
So because of this complete misunderstanding of Jesus and his teaching, we now see that the people have allowed unbelief to creep in, and many of them are now turning completely away from Jesus and going back to their old lives, their old way of thinking, and their old way of doing things. Basically, Jesus has just begun rooting out the true believers from the false believers. We see this with how the large group of followers he's addressing and the local Jews and even the 12 apostles, how their loyalty is questioned. However, in the end, we we learn that the 12 are the ones showing that they do in fact believe in Jesus. Well, all of them, except for Judas, who at this point had begun turning away from the Lord in secret. But Jesus knows his heart. Now, That summarizes the entire story as a whole. However, the question still remains, what is the point that Jesus wants us to walk away with? Well, if you were to take all these verses and condense them into a simple statement, you would come to see that the only true faith that clings to Jesus brings everlasting life. You can take 31 verses and condense it that simply. Everything Jesus is focusing on here revolves around your belief and faith in him. Are you going to trust Jesus with your life and be filled by him? Or are you just going to be a surface level believer who will ultimately turn tail and reject Jesus when the rubber hits the road and trials and difficulties come? Now, the great news is there are a few key verses that help us work all this out and see exactly what Jesus is pointing us to. So for the rest of the day, I'd like to to focus on those verses. You see in verses 61 through 65, Jesus perfectly condenses all of chapter 6's teaching for us. So let's just read these verses one more time, starting in verse 61. God's word tells us, But Jesus, conscious that his disciples grumbled at this, said to them, does this cause you to stumble? What then if you see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and are life. So stopping right there, we come to the first key point for today, which is that we who place our belief in Jesus must turn from the physical and be filled in spirit by the word of God. Here in these verses, Jesus understands that his disciples are having a hard time grasping his teaching. Because of that, we now see that he he decides to clarify his message to them. Jesus urges his followers to get their mind off the physical aspect of what he's teaching, meaning the manna that was given to them way back in the desert or the food he just produced in this miracle. He's saying, get off the physical aspect of the miracle and focus on the spiritual life his words are now offering. Basically, Jesus is calling his audience to stop focusing on the physical surface level of their lives and instead focus on the spiritual problem that they have. He's trying to get them to understand they need him. They are lost and broken. They are separated from a true relationship with God because of their sin. So because of this separation, a sacrifice must be made. That's what Jesus is trying to get them to understand. A sacrifice has to happen. And even more than that, he wants them to understand that that in order to receive the benefit of the sacrifice that is to come through him, a spiritual transformation must also take place. Jesus must be the one that fills our lives. His teaching, his very words are a part of the way we are filled and fed by him. Here Jesus is urging us to turn from the physical and be filled in spirit by the very word of God who took on flesh, who came to save us. So how does this apply to our lives? 
what we first have to understand that we as people truly do struggle with this issue of filling our lives with the physical things of the world rather than with Jesus and his word. If we're being blatantly honest, we struggle with this. When life gets rough, when you feel depressed, when you, when you allow your feelings and emotions to take the lead, what do we run to for comfort and support? Is it Jesus and what he has to tell us regarding who we are to him? Or the fact that, that in Jesus we are loved and adopted into his family through his grace and his loving sacrifice? Is that what fills us? Or do we run to our phones? Food. TV. You name it and any other such lesser form of wisdom that only makes things worse because we have now avoided the very issue at hand. We people are masters at avoiding the problem. And Jesus is confronting that here. We need to be filled with him, not the physical things that are lesser. It is Jesus and what he has to tell us regarding who we are that we need. Jesus, his truth, his word is our very roadmap in life and, and our belief in him and his, and his word is what helps to continually feed our souls so that, so that we can see life clearly. And respond appropriately to all that this world has to throw at us. Do you think we would see all the garbage going on in the world right now if they would see things through Jesus' lens? No, we wouldn't. We need to lay our emotions, our feelings back behind us, put them back in the cart where they belong. And Jesus needs to take center stage. We must be willing to turn from the physical and be filled in spirit by the word of God. This way we can truly grow in not only our relationship with Jesus, but in our spiritual understanding of what is tr- it truly means to trust in Jesus and walk by faith. See, the more we're filled by him, the easier it is to walk by faith. Alfred Langstein, in his book, Endurance, tells how in 1914, Ernest Shackleton and a team of explorers set out from England to do something that that no one before had ever accomplished. They wanted to cross the Antarctic from one side to the other across the South Pole. Disaster struck when the team's ship, named Endurance, became entrapped in ice and eventually sank after her hull was crushed. Marooned on nearby Elephant Island, there seemed little hope for their survival. In a desperate effort to get help, Shackleton and five others set out in a 20-foot lifeboat across some of the most dangerous and storm-filled waters in the world. It was an 800-mile journey to South Georgia Island where help could be found. For 15 days, the men battled the treacherous seas and massive storms with waves of up to 100 feet. That's my nightmare. Using only a compass and a sexton, Frank Worsley, who had captained the Endurance, navigated their course until they safely reached land and found help. Shackleton procured another ship, and returned to rescue all of his men. He became a national hero in England for his courage and persistence. See, all of us are making our way through a stormy world. Ever since the first sin in the Garden of Eden, mankind has struggled to make wise decisions about an uncertain future. The only way to ensure that we do not go astray is to have an objective source of truth that will guide us. Just as the compass can guide sailors through dark and 
uncharted waters, God's word can guide us through uncertain and difficult circumstances. We must simply trust it over our feelings, over our own wisdom, and over contrary advice that others may give us. Because the Bible is the inspired word of God. It is without error, and we can always trust it. Jesus desperately wants us all to stop trusting the things of this world. Instead, he calls us to believe in him and his word, even when some of his teachings may at times seem hard to accept or understand. That's what this group of people that he's addressing, his teaching was a little hard for them to understand. Part of my problem that I see here with them is they just didn't ask the right questions. They grumbled. Heaven forbid you ask the king of kings, the lord of lords, the great teacher, what do you mean by that? I think he would have loved to have that conversation. For Jesus' word is true and his word offers us life. Turn from the physical and be filled in the spirit by the word of God. Continuing on, we come to the second verse, which helps clarify things. Picking back up in verse 64, God's word says, But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were, who did not believe, and who it was that would betray him. The second key point for today is that we all need to let go of unbelief and instead trust in Jesus. Jesus now goes straight to the heart of the problem with his followers. Are they simply, or they are simply just not willing to put their belief in him. If, if we were to go all the way back to the feeding of the 5,000, which was the miracle that jump-started this entire sermon from Jesus, what we, we see at the heart of the people is that they do not actually believe Jesus as the Messiah sent from God. Instead, They just want to see Jesus perform for them. Do a little magic trick. Keep showing us those tricks. So when Jesus actually challenges their hearts by presenting the truth about his his sacrifice and our need for his spirit to fill our lives, well, the truth is then revealed regarding the hearts of the people. You have to come to understand that that after this sermon that Jesus gave, many of his disciples flat out leave and reject him. You even can hear the pain in Jesus' words as he talks to his 12 apostles afterwards. Do you want to leave as well? They don't want what he has to offer. And that is at the root of their unbelief. We today have to evaluate our own hearts regarding Jesus. Are we simply pretending to believe in him and his truth? Or do we actually actually believe what Jesus tells us? And are we living out his truth through our belief in a similar way that we see Peter and the apostles doing? We have nowhere else to go. What's great about this is excluding Judas and his actions. Peter and the apostles were starting to understand that he's the Messiah. And they were understanding, I need you. They might not have fully grasped everything, but they were putting their belief and trust where it needed to be in Jesus. But what do I mean by this? Or better yet, how does it look in our lives? Well, simply put, if if our belief in Jesus is genuine, if our trust in his word is pure, well, then our very existence will be changed and show the fruit of that change. The way we, we live, walk, talk, think, love, forgive, and interact with others should bear the fruit of our belief. If we truly believe in Jesus and his word, if we truly believe in loving God first and then loving others as Christ loves us, 
then are we truly displaying that belief within the world and within our relationships? This is a hard thing to wrestle with because it means you have to change. I've said it once before, old dogs can't learn new tricks, and I hate that statement. Old dogs can learn new tricks, and we can change in Jesus. The way we live, walk, talk, think, love, forgive, and interact with others should bear the fruit of our belief. Here, Jesus is calling us to a deeper form of faith. He has called us to get off of the surface level faith. He basically is saying, quit playing games and enter into and live out deep and unwavering faith. His apostles were the ones standing. Eleven. After this difficult teaching that Jesus is the Messiah, he's going to have to sacrifice himself and we need to have him embody our entire life and soul. We are either all in with Jesus or we are just pretending. I think this story from Bits and Pieces helps put this into perspective when it describes how a man fell off a cliff but managed to grab just a little tree limb on the way down. Then this following conversation happened. Is anyone up there? I am here. I am the Lord. Do you believe in me? Yes, Lord, I believe. I really believe, but I can't hang on much longer. That's all right. If you really believe, you have nothing to worry about. I will save you. Just let go of the branch. There was a moment of silence. And then the man said, Is anyone else up there? See, I know this is a little bit of a funny story. However, many of Jesus' followers were just like the man in this story. When time came for them to display and live out their faith in Jesus, they simply did not want what Jesus was offering. We also need to be on guard and examine our own lives so that we do not wind up doing the same thing. We need to let go of unbelief and instead trust in Jesus. That way we can truly allow his transforming power to mold and shape our lives. Continuing on, we come to the final section of scripture for today, and it's not a long one. It's one single little verse. Verse 65, now God's word says, and he was saying, for this reason I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted him from the Father. The final key point for today is that we must be a people who respond to God as he draws you to Jesus. So yet again, Jesus is coming full circle in his preaching to help the people come to understand that true belief is rooted in the works of God. Through the power of God, Jesus has just performed a miraculous miracle. And Jesus has followed up that miracle with his teaching in order to help them understand what has just taken place and to point them forward to his sacrifice on the cross. All of this is because God is actively working within the lives of the people. God is calling them, as well as us today, to true belief in Jesus. God chooses to reach out to us as people in order to reach our hearts. However, as God works on our hearts, as God helps us to see the truth of Jesus, see, a response on our end has to take place. Meaning we must allow our hearts and our very lives to continue to be moving forward and growing in Jesus. We have to accept him. Jesus is providing us with what I, right here, Jesus is providing us with relational imagery. It's imagery, he's trying to paint a picture of our relationship with God. 
We can't come to Jesus if God does not draw us to him. But we also, as a part of the relationship, need to respond to his calling by placing our belief in Christ. But how is it that God is drawing us to Christ? Well, before I answer that, I have to address a little bit of an issue because we have a little bit of a a controversy here because our our lovely um, Calvinistic brothers and sisters would say, you can't respond to God unless he calls to you. You have no free will. You don't play a part. And in fact, if you say that your free will has any part of it, that's considered a work. Well, God doesn't actually consider your free will and your exercise of that free will as a work. It is clear in scripture. I I recommend going to Romans. That will clarify some things when he starts talking about Abraham and Abraham's faith. So with that cleared up, I'm not talking about Calvinistic views here. I am talking about the fact that God reaches out to us. And in that we are called to respond. God begins calling our hearts to him, and he does that. He does that by the very words of Christ. Jesus said it earlier, my words bring life. God is reaching us through the very words of Christ. As the gospel goes out and reaches people, God begins calling our hearts to him. However, it is crucial that a choice be made on our end. We have to respond to God's calling. There's a reason Jesus says, go preach the gospel. That's God reaching out. God, in his great wisdom, has allowed our free will to play a part in whether or not we place our belief in Jesus. You get to choose. He is not going to force himself upon us as believers. He's not going to force us to believe. He has given us a choice. God is a gentleman. However, through his his word, the very gospel of Christ, he calls us to exercise our free will and accept and embrace the truth of Jesus who alone offers everlasting life. It is vital that we respond to God as he draws us to Jesus. For in Christ, salvation is found. In Christ, the sin problem has been eradicated. In Christ, everlasting life is our reward. He's trying to get his audience to understand that. It's so simple. And yet they chose to leave We can't make that mistake. An unknown source once explained how C.H. Spurgeon claimed that 98% of the people he met, including the criminals he visited in England's prison, told him that they believed in God and the Bible to be true. But the vast majority had never made a personal life-changing commitment to Jesus Christ. For them, believe was not an action verb. Only true faith that clings to Jesus brings everlasting life. Our faith must be active and growing day by day. Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. In order to have that life Jesus is offering, you must continue to have faith that clings to Jesus no matter the cost. So I encourage us all here today to evaluate our own belief and to go all in. When it comes to trusting in and relying on Jesus. See, I promise you, if you you go all in, Jesus will never let you down. He is with you and he is fighting for you. And in Christ alone, all things are possible. Only true faith that clings to Jesus brings everlasting life. Will you please pray with me? 
dear Jesus, we come to you and we just thank you for your word and how it perfectly shows just how desperately you have tried to open the hearts and minds of us as people. You gave everything so that we could have life, Father. All you ask is that we simply believe and allow you to spread your grace upon us as we enter into a true relationship, a true relationship that offers everlasting life, no fear of death, Jesus, thank you. I pray for each and every person here, each and every person that's online that's, that's listening with us as well. Help our belief to be strong, unwavering, and fully focused on you and you alone, Jesus. We love you and we praise you, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. So it would only be right that I titled this decision time to actually have a decision time. So we, we have the option and opportunity to make some decisions. If you haven't even begun to put your belief in Jesus, today's the day. He is standing there with arms wide open. He is ready and willing and desperately wanting to forgive every sin you've ever had and to enter into true relationship with you to where you're filled with his spirit. If that's you today and you need to make that decision, anytime during the song as we're singing, I invite you to come forward to make that decision. It doesn't take long for us to fill the baptistry up behind us. I will keep saying that till the day I die. I get to say that with regards to baptism because it's right there. We got to use that thing. And if you're ready to make that decision, let's start making the preparations. Also, the other decisions that need to be made. I had challenged us and encouraged us to please evaluate your own belief, your own faith. We often have to do that lest we find out that we're lacking. You got to remind yourself. You got to re strengthen yourself. Turn to the word of the Lord if your faith is lacking in any way. Turn to Jesus. Make the decision to trust him. He will willingly embrace you. You can make that decision right where you sit. You don't need to come forward to do that. But I encourage you if you are needing that decision to be made, don't hesitate. Make it. So will you please stand as we sing this song? We have some trivia, and this is going to count if you listened at the very beginning and read along with me. John 6, 47, truly, truly, I say to you, the one who believes has blank, blank, eternal life, everlasting life, they all work, life forever in all eternity. All right, in John six fifty two, why did the Jews begin arguing with one another. There will be multiple answers. It's all the same generic thing. What was it? Does he want us to eat his flesh? What was the word I used? Cannibalism. 
So anything with the concept of they thought Jesus said, come eat me. And though he did, he was talking about some other things. All right. Was there only three? Okay, we'll just keep going. When Jesus speaks of the bread that came down from heaven for your fathers, who and what is Jesus referring to? Moses and the manna from heaven. Or the Israelites wandering. So when we say Moses, that typically comes with that concept. Is that it? And I was told there weren't any more prayer requests. I got a couple. Um, Chuck Davison, you, you guys all know who Chuck is. He's the, he brings us donuts faithfully. Well, he hurt his lower back. Um, and he has a really bad pinch sciatic nerve. He, he needed help. He needed somebody to come help him at home to get him to the emergency room. He was in the emergency room all day yesterday. They gave him some um, steroid injections in his back and a little bit of pain medicine to be able to help with it. But he needs prayer for healing because if he doesn't, isn't able to be healed and get this under control, then he was telling me the next stage would be surgery. So we really want to pray and ask the Lord to, to, that we could take care of this without surgery. That would be a blessing. So please be praying for Chuck. And I, I know he said he wanted to um, um, sign in on Facebook. He was asking how to do that. So hopefully he was able to do that. Um, also, Carmelita, she's asking that we please pray for the people of the, the Philippines because there was apparently there's been an eruption from a volcano that they are evacuating people in, in fear that there may be a tsunami coming. So we need to be praying for the Filipino people um, over there because that's always a scary situation when any of that kind of stuff is, is coming. So please pray for all of them. And then last but not least, I have one. It's from, I believe this was from Kyla. Kyla, she's asking, please be praying for me and the family. We're going to be traveling to Wallawa um, sometime tonight, and we won't be back till Wednesday. She just asked for safe travels there and back. They're super excited to see their nani and their grandmas and grandpas, and so we're going to take a little bit of time to go visit some people. So please be praying for us during that travel time. Any Another one? Paul was asked, but she had a grandson and he passed away suddenly, so he was asking to pray for the family. Okay, so Bonnie Hall had a grandson that passed away suddenly. We need to be praying for her and the family with that. Is there anything else? No? Huh? The world, as, as yes, let's just pray for this world. We desperately need to. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you to thank you so much for being a God who so willingly just wants to hear us come before you and pray and speak with you and be in relationship with you, God. We thank you for this opportunity. And we come before your very throne, Lord, just to ask that you be with Chuck and his back issues, Lord, that you would heal him and help it not to lead to surgery, that he could just be healed and get through this without ever having to go there. Father, we also pray for Bonnie Hall's um, family. Um, with the loss of a grandchild that is never easy, a sudden loss, Father. I pray that you be with each and every one of the family members during this time of grief, that your comfort, your love, your peace will wrap your arms around them and be with them and remind them that they are not alone, that they, they have you. Father, I also pray for all the people in the Philippines that are having to evacuate and are in fear of being hit with a tsunami. I, d I pray, Lord, for your protection on all those people, that you would help them to be able to get to safety, and that, Lord, I, I also just pray that if there is a tsunami, that it, it is not something catastrophic, that it would be a smaller incident and that nobody would be hurt. Father, I also just pray and ask that you be with my family and I as we travel. Keep us safe. Help us to enjoy that time and to come back and um, enjoy our time being back here. We love you and we praise you, and it is in Jesus' holy name that we pray. Amen. Will you please stand as we sing this final song?
save your seats. One thing that I should have spoke up earlier, but there are many, many children that have been displaced by this ugly, ugly war. They're hungry. They don't have anywhere to go. So let's just keep the children in mind in Ukraine, in Poland, and wherever else. Thank you. You are dismissed. Thank you.